stay hungry, stay foolish. Usually when I introduce a guest in the book on the show, I have written it down, sometimes I rehearse it, I certainly use maybe elements from the Amazon introduction when I do that. But I think doing that for this book just can't give it do it justice at all. So I'm going to speak from the right brain from the right hemisphere here mixed a little bit with my heart a bit of heart brain coherence. And I'm just going to say what I think of this book and this magnificent guest that we have today. This book is if I recommend any book that you read, this is a once in a generation book, it is so important to read this book. Our guest, and I hope through the show gifts us a new lens through which to experience the world to attend to the world. And I certainly get that from any time I indulge in any of his content, any of his writing, any of his podcasts, any of his channel that he's so magnificently put together. He is a change maker, he's a paradigm shifter. He certainly has done that in the realm in which he has written this book. It's three decades plus in the making of this book, the research is just phenomenal. The appendix itself is a book. <laughs> if you ever need any research on the brain, this book gives an appendix and you will never have to look any further. The amount of research is just absolutely phenomenal. I cannot do it enough justice. But what I can say is that my left brain, my left hemisphere wants to give you a logical introduction to this book, but I'm going to let the master which is my right hemisphere, give that introduction. And our guest is a polymath. He's a modern day Leonardo da Vinci. He is so widely disciplined in a wide range of backgrounds and disciplines, and so much research. And as he talks about in his book, when you have that you have a great tension of opposites the left and the right hemisphere coming together. And just like a bow, as Heraclitus would say, is not useful if it's not pulled taut. He has created this tension of opposites and forth from the bow, if it's a bow and arrow has come this magnificent oeuvre. And the French word oeuvre means a body of work. And it truly is a body of work. And it's a great pleasure to have him on the show. He is the author of my previous favorite show we've ever done in the 350 odd episodes we've done for this, it was the master and his emissary, magnificent book. Every time I go back and listen to that or read any pages from it, I learn something. And with his new oeuvre, he's created something truly magnificent something as I say, it, which is a book in a generation, anybody I've met since I started reading this, and I'm not finished it. I say if there's one book you read, in the next two or three years, read this because it might take that long to actually absorb the amount of content that is in it. It is a great pleasure to welcome the author of The Matter With Things, Ian McGilchrist. Ian, you are very welcome. Oh, Aidan, what can I possibly say after that introduction, except that I'll be jolly lucky if I can live up to a tenth of it. But thank you very much. Well, we're not going to. We're not <laughs> because we can't. It's, it's, a, a, it's a decade, I think, since you wrote The Master and His Emissary. And what I find absolutely incredible is that this book was supposed to be a summary of that book. <laughs> and it became something <laughs> it's much very funny. more magnificent. Yes, yes. No, it was intended to be um, a short version of The Master and His Emissary. It's now about three times as long. And it's explored all the philosophical implications of what it means that we have two uh, conscious centers in our brain that are producing different kinds of experience. I thought we'd start with the way you do in the book, and you start with a note to the reader. And I think this is really important to give context, you say, this book is what would conventionally be called a single argument. That is why I have chosen not to publish it as three separate books, one on neuropsychology, how our brains shape reality, one on epistemology, how we can come to know anything at all, and one on metaphysics, the nature of what we find in the cosmos. It is intended as a whole each part illuminating and in turn illumined by the others. Yes, yeah, well, it has a logical structure in a way, um, although, as it, once again, everything connects to everything else. But I, I wanted to address the ancient question 
of who we are. Um, this is a question that, as Schrödinger pointed out in a lecture in Cambridge just after the war, it was asked by Plotinus, the third century Greek philosopher. But we, who are we? And it seemed to me the urgent question of our age. I think we've completely lost any sense of what a human being is, what we're about in this world, how we relate to the world, and what the whole business of the cosmos is like. We seem to have lost any sense of direction, of meaning, of value, of purpose, and we're on the point of turning ourselves into a kind of robot. And this seemed to me a terrible thing to be happening. In fact, I now consider this crisis of humanity to be on a par with the crisis of the destruction of nature. Because we may or may not um, be able to do something about the way we're destroying nature. Nature, in the end, will rebuild herself. Nature has always done this. But we may simply not survive um, because of what we're doing to ourselves. We're becoming measurably less happy I mean, enormously much less happy, more stressed, more anxious, more depressed, with a, an overwhelming sense of pointlessness. And this is something, this is a major tragedy. So what in this book I try to do is to go back. How do we know anything? If it's true, as I demonstrated in The Master and His Emissary, that the two halves of the brain present two versions of the world, which are not necessarily entirely compatible, which one should we trust? That is the subject of part one of the book. And what I've tried to do there is to show that in all the ways that I would say are portals to finding out about the world, and by those portals I mean the immediate access we have by attending to it, by perceiving it, by forming judgments on the basis of our attention and perception. In other words, thinking. Uh, what we bring from our emotional and social intelligence, from our cognitive intelligence, and from our ability to create. These are the things that enable us to bring into being an experiential world. And what I show is that in every single case, the right hemisphere is more veridical than the left, more reliable, more truthful than the left. And this is evident in simple things like most of the great delusions, hallucinations that are described in neuropsychiatry are due to damage to the right hemisphere, not to the left. Then in the second part of the book, what I do is to look at the question, so, okay, let's take that forward a step. What are the paths to understanding? What are the ways in which we can really gain knowledge of and an understanding of the world? Well, most people would say science. And I don't disagree at all. Another would be reason. And again, uh, count me in on that one. But also, I believe, and these are less popular nowadays, intuition and imagination. And so in the second part of the book, which is addressing epistemology, how do we understand and know anything, um, I look at each of those in turn and look at what their strengths and their weaknesses are, what they can do and what their limitations are. And effectively what I find there, in brief, is that we need all of these, or at least as many as we possibly can bring to bear at any one time, whereas we're accustomed to often bringing only one or a maximum of two to bear on any question. And that secondly, the most important part Part of each of these, including science and reason, is provided by the right hemisphere of the brain. And then the last part is, okay, so now we've got that far down the road, here's the moment at which we look at the cosmos in which we find ourselves and say, what is it like? And in that part of the book, I address what kind of structure does it have, and I talk about the way in which opposites coincide, rather than being as far as possible away from one another, as we fantasize is the case. Um, how oneness, individuality, relates to wholeness, the one and the many, a famous problem in philosophies, particularly in Oriental philosophy. And then I look at what people would call the building blocks of the world, time and space and flow, um, matter, consciousness, but also, to some people's surprise, values, purpose, and the sense of the sacred, which I argue are as much building blocks of the cosmos as time and space themselves. So that's the structure. 
And it hardly surprisingly takes me a few pages to get there. <laughs> so, um, but I, what I would say is the journey, not the arrival matters. It's not that it all leads up to this one moment. It's that in reading, I'm hoping that there is companionable conversation with the reader. And I, I, in this note to the reader, which is about the only short thing I ever wrote in my life, it's less than two pages long, I say, you know, consider it a journey in which we go and look at a landscape and we look at it from different points of view. And we can stop and have a picnic or we can call it a day and spend the night... Uh, camping and then move on the next day but we don't have to do it all at once and so I invite the reader to dip in and dip in in other places and I suspect that if they start to do that they'll want to read the whole story and how it hangs together so that's laying it out for for our listeners I hope Aidan. You have consumed a wide range of content but you've made it really readable and that's what's so beautiful about the experience and there's a line I wanted to share because I can't resist because it also speaks to the spirit of this show and also because I love the root of the word education which as you know is educe which is to draw out as in draw out potential and I felt that that's what you were trying to do with the book as well because you say we can't make a plant from a seed we can however choose to stunt it or permit it to flourish and you say i want to permit something that i believe is already there in the reader to flourish and i was hoping that that's what we could do today we could start the flourishing for those people who have the opportunity to listen to this and please do listen all the way through because it is we won't get even near the amount of content that is in this book but uh, let's jump into the fact that you are, I mentioned in the introduction, a change maker, a paradigm shifter, but that doesn't come without some type of consequence because you launch into something that is, has been a very divisive element, which is the, the battle of the hemispheres, if you want to call it that. And you say the brain is importantly divided into two hemispheres. You could say to sum it up, to sum up a vastly complex matter in a phrase that the brain's left hemisphere is designed to help us apprehend and thus manipulate the world the right hemisphere to comprehend it see it for all that it is the problem is that the very brain mechanisms which succeed in simplifying the world so as to subject it to our control militate against a true understanding of it and here, I wanted to firstly, if you wouldn't mind telling us about that challenge that you've had to debunk the debunking of the hemisphere <laughs> myth, as it used to be called, but also then this understanding of both comprehend and apprehend, which I found fascinating. Yes, I'm using the word apprehend in a restricted sense. Um, it comes from a root in Latin, which means to take hold of, to, to, to grasp onto something. Um, and what I mean by that is to get it in one's grip so that one can use it finally. So in order to survive, we desperately need all the time to be getting stuff, even if it's so simple as just getting food. But we also need to get hold of things in order to make things for ourselves, to, to, to provide shelter, to provide clothing, to provide all the necessities of life. We need to manipulate the world. And that is the task, the very important task of the left hemisphere. But the right hemisphere is therefore left with the rest of what we need a brain for, which is seeing the whole. And I give this image of a bird trying to pick up a seed on the background of grit or pebbles. It needs to be very um, quick and dexterous in picking up this tiny little thing. So it has to fix it with its attention and see it very, very clearly in order to be able to get it. But that means that at that moment, it's completely taken up with this task. And if it were not to be able to look out for everything else that was going on, it would become somebody else's lunch while it was getting its own. And that's where the other part of the brain, the right hemisphere, keeps a broad, open vigilance to everything 
in the entirety of one's attentional field. Um, and that is the very important task of the right hemisphere. So clearly we need both of these. We need them both to be working. It's not that somehow the left hemisphere is um, something we can do without. We can't possibly do without it. But the trouble is that it sees less than the right hemisphere, literally, in that it has a, a more narrow scope. But it also basically creates a world which is like a map, uh, whereas the right hemisphere is seeing the, the field that is mapped. It's seeing the real world before it is mapped, if you like. And the difference between the world which we experience and the map is that the map contains almost nothing of the real world. It just contains the bare bones, a schema, a theory, a diagram of the world. And unfortunately, we now are paying so much attention to what the left hemisphere tells us uh, in its very technical way that we think we live in this map rather than in the real living world. And I think that's where we could begin thinking about what is the matter with us these days. It's a beautiful uh, idea. And this is where I mean the, the new lenses you give us, because not only I mean, the way I perceive now the world or attend to it. But for example, I never look at a bird the same way. <laughs> since. So when, when I see a bird, for example, where where my old studio used to be, there was a lot of pigeons. Now there's a lot of seagulls. But the pigeon would often like turn its head. And I know what the pigeon was doing. So I was like, oh, it's it's looking in to see if there's any food there. And then it turned the other way. And I gone, it's now scanning the area for threats, for example. And I thought that that was really interesting, because that in a way is a place we can build and show well, if that's a, an animal with such a simple brain, a simplified version of our brain, there's still traits there that are very relevant to a human. Absolutely. And what you've drawn attention to is, quite rightly, is that this isn't just something about the human brain. It's something about every brain that we've looked at. So the brains of other mammals, of amphibians, reptiles, down to even the, 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 um, the neural networks of insects, um, nematode worms, and down to the most ancient creature still alive in this world, Nematostella vectensis, a sea anemone, 700 million years old, it already has an asymmetrical neural net. So it's got to be something pretty profound. What I... I, I suppose I ought to do is to say something about, because you invited me to do so, about the need to um, debunk the debunkers. Because uh, when I started on this process of learning about 30 years ago, learning about the hemispheres, many of my colleagues begged me not to get involved in it. They said, look, you've got a, a reasonably promising career ahead of you. You don't want to commit suicide at this stage. But if you get involved with this, people just won't take you seriously. Because we know it's all rubbish. Well, what we knew was, quote, rubbish, was indeed largely inaccurate. It was a misconception that the brain is something like a computer, and therefore we needed to find out what does it do. And people answered that question in the 70s by saying, well, it looks as though the left hemisphere does reason and language, and the right hemisphere does pictures and emotion. And we now know, of course, that both hemispheres are involved in reason, in language, in, in visuospatial uh, imagery, and in emotion. So that can't be right. So where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us actually with something very important and interesting, which is, first of all, that it's not a computer. And therefore, asking what it does may not be the right question. The question one might want to ask instead is how does it do it? When <clears throat> we meet a new person and we make an acquaintance, we want to describe them to somebody else, we don't say all the things that that person does because we know that. He or she reasons and so on. No, what we want is to know in what way, what's it like to encounter this person? Well, you can see the hemispheres as part of a person. That is a more accurate way, actually, of seeing it than 
as a simple mindless machine. And if you want to start looking at the different ways in which the hemispheres approach the world, you see an entirely coherent picture for the left and for the right hemisphere. And they, it's to do with this quality of attention. When I first discovered about the attentional difference, the penny didn't quite drop immediately. And then I thought, oh God, attention changes the world. And so if they're attending differently, they've got to be producing different worlds. So the two parts of my um, hypothesis are not disputable by experts in their field. What's unusual is bringing them together. So neuroscientists, neuropsychiatrists, neurologists will not dispute the fact that the two hemispheres are different, that when you have a lesion in one place in the left hemisphere and in the mirror image place in the right hemisphere, it will lead to completely different consequences for the person. So that is not um, an issue, nor is it that they attend differently. Everyone knows it's not controversial that the left hemisphere pays this, pays this narrow beam attention, the right hemisphere this broad, open, vigilant attention. So that's not controversial. And to philosophers, it is not controversial that attention changes the, what we find. If we attend in one way, we see one thing. If we attend in another, we see another. It's just that what I did was take these two things, one from science and the other from philosophy, and put them together. And if you do that, what you find is two different experiential worlds. Left hemisphere's world being made up of fragments that are static, separate, are decontextualized, disembodied, abstract, categorizable, and inanimate. Whereas in the right hemisphere, you see that things are all actually interconnected, that nothing is ever isolated completely, that they're also not fixed and certain, but always something coming into being. They're becoming, they're in process all the time. That they're also unique, that you can, for convenience sake, group them together. But everything you actually experience is unique. Uh, each blade of grass is actually quite different from every other blade of grass. That we can only understand things in their context, that once we take them out of the context, as the left hemisphere does, they change their meaning. Um, and that we're dealing with something that is embodied and animate, and where a lot of the meaning is implicit. And that by making it explicit, which is the only kind of meaning the left hemisphere has, we ruin it, we change it. We lose it. As we do when we explain a joke or paraphrase a poem, it turns into something quite different. I love it, Ian, and I hope that by now the penny is dropping, which it is, I'm sure, for many of our audience, about how relevant that is to you as a change maker. I mean, you, the audience, people who work in change or transformation in particular, are probably more right hemisphere oriented and they work in a left hemisphere world. And I found this particularly interesting because I, I thought about, I thought it'd be interesting to share the master and his emissary, the original story that, that influenced you for And by the way, I love your titles as well. They're so clever, but also researched and, and have such deep meaning. But one of the things I thought about was for anybody who's been in a brainstorming session, I, I, I do something in my own sessions where I call it quiet storming, where I let people have a week or two before the brainstorming session to absorb the material or to have those moments in the shower where you're in a different headspace, the brain waves are at a different speed in order to go, oh, and I know what I'm going to share. But also for the introvert, for those people who are probably don't get a voice because often the hippo, the highest paid person in the room, they dominate those meetings. And they also speak the language of the organization. And that language gets listened to more, they have more of a voice. And as a, resu a result, the master, <laughs> masterful person gets drowned out by the emissary. And this is a huge problem in innovation and change and creation. That's a very good point you make. And uh, as you know, when I 
get on to talking about intuition in the middle part of the book, I d draw attention to masses of evidence that it's during those fallow periods when we are quiet and not consciously examining things that creativity takes place and new shapes form in our minds so that we can actually apprehend something truly new. So that is very, very important. It's rather like you'd start off mentioning the image of the gardener. And, you know, I say a gardener can't make a plant grow, but a gardener can create the circumstances for the plant to thrive or not. And it's that business of planting the seed and just occasionally uh, watering it, but largely keeping the land clear so that it can grow of its own accord. It won't grow faster if you keep pulling it up by the roots to have a look at how it's doing. So we need to let, leave things alone uh, if we want them to um, uh, repay us with um, an imaginative answer. But yes, uh, the the idea that um, there is a kind of noisy person that's going to drown out the more thoughtful person is a good place to start. And the image of the master and his emissary um, is from this fable that I... I say I found in Nietzsche, I'm now rather doubtful that I ever did, but there we are. But um, yes, the, the, the idea there is quite simply that there is a wise spiritual master who knows what he needs to do in order to look after a community so that it thrives. And he knows after a while that as the community grows and continues to thrive and expand, that the are things that he simply can't get involved with, not just because he can't do everything, but because there are certain things that he really ought not to get involved with if he's to be able to maintain his oversight from which his whole value as a master um, derives. And so he appoints um, a, 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 a bright second in command, to go about his business, uh, effectively, you know, a, an efficient bureaucrat who will carry out certain procedures on his behalf. The trouble is that the, the emissary in this story, being sort of bright but not terribly bright, thinks it knows everything and doesn't know how much it doesn't know. And so it does all the talking, it says, I'm the master, and it forgets to take what it's done back to the master and instead pretends it is the master. And as soon as it starts to do that, because it doesn't know what it is it doesn't know, the whole situation deteriorates and falls apart. Um, and what I didn't know at that time, but I've discovered in the uh, 12 years since the publication of The Master and His Emissary, is that versions of this story exist in cultures spread right round the globe, in China, in Japan, in India, in North American native lore. There are stories, one of the most extraordinary, being an Iroquois legend that I recount right at the beginning of part three, um, in which they have obviously intuited knowing nothing about the brain itself. They've intuited the nature of their mind, of their consciousness, and seen that there is one part that is very wise and understands much, but another part that thinks it knows everything, but in fact is dangerous if it becomes too powerful. It should be in the subordinate position always as a faithful servant. And as a servant, there's nothing wrong with it. The problem arises when it becomes the master. And so you see this in The, um, the Secret of the Golden Flower, um, a 9th century Chinese mystical te text, in the I Ching, uh, in the Vedanta, and as I say, in this Iroquois legend, and no doubt in other places too. The Iroquois legend and the the brain going right back to the pigeon, and the I just always see the pigeon kind of looking at you like that. And I used to kind of go, "Pigeons are freaky, man. They're they're staring at me." <laughs> and then when I understood, I was like, God, I, "Now I know." But I thought about again, bringing it to the business world. And I, I'd love you to share the Iroquois legend because it's absolutely beautiful. And it links also to a story you told once about then in politics, for example, and where I'm going with this is back to that brainstorming session or back to the boardroom of a legacy established organization. It started with the right hemisphere, someone 
created this from those moments of quietude, those moments of pondering and emergence, the business starts from there, but then they hire in the left hemisphere people, they take over the organization. And oftentimes, then they try and rule the organization by Excel spreadsheets, rather than Photoshop, rather than creativity, the, the left takes over the logics, etc. And then because you said as well, the left tries to categorize, it tries to categorize those people who don't fit in a category who are so essential today, and they quash them and they jettison them from the organization, the very people who are so necessary for its survival are gone. And the organization goes through a slow, gradual decline, the way it had a slow, gradual start in the first place. So th that that was quite important to me that uh, aspect, but I wanted to share this with you. And you may know about Dr. Andrew Huberman, he, he has a magnificent podcast, you'd love it. it. It's essentially about human performance. But he he talked about in the he's a, a special interest in the eye. And one of the analogies I draw I drew between your work and his was, he talked about if you look at an eye when it's excited or interested or, or stressed. So by it could be somebody attractive walks by, or it could be a threat, it re reacts in the same way it dilates. And it, it, it zooms in on that threat, just like the pigeon. But if you look, for example, into the forest, you will see one tree at the expense of all the rest of the forest. So you don't see the forest for the trees. But if the eye is relaxed, and it's in a different, more creative space or alpha wave state from a brain perspective, it sees the entire forest. And I thought that's exactly what Ian's talking about here. But, he, but Andrew was talking about stress. But this is what happens in organizations when it's like, okay, we have the strategy agreed, now we're going to focus like heck, and we're going to deliver that strategy. And as a result, they miss all other opportunities, and all of the threats in the environment as a result of that. And this I thought was a way to tee you up perhaps for the Iroquois legend. But also, one of the stories he told was the Native American chief, who said one of the reasons mankind is doomed is because of this unbelievable focus. And this also links then to a successful, I think it was a politician or a business person who also shared that was the reason for their success. Yes, yes. Perhaps I could just say about the situation that uh, will be important for many of your listeners. Um, there are two aspects to it. One is the mishandling of people who are creative. And the other is the over domination by people who are effectively organizers or bureaucrats. And we see both of these things happening. For example, you cannot make people creative to order. Your best plan for making them creative is to leave them alone and stop giving them deadlines. Now, it is true that sometimes nothing will happen. You have to accept that risk. But if instead you enforce a goal that has to be achieved in a certain length of time, you will guarantee that nothing truly creative will ever happen. I have some experience of this myself, in that just after graduation, I won what is really the most wonderful prize that any young person could, in those days, or even now, expect to, to uh, receive which was a fellowship of All Souls College, in which I was given no obligations to teach or research or do anything for seven years. And nobody said, what are you doing? But if I'd had to publish a paper every three months, I would have narrowed down my thinking very quickly to certain specifiable tram tracks. But because I wasn't, I was able to lay down what I now see was the basis for being able to write the books that I've written later in life. Because it was then that I was able to follow my interests in philosophy, in different languages, in science, and so forth. And it was that freedom that enabled me to be able to be creative, if I have been creative, as people tell me I have. So <laughs> um, the other side of that is the, the domination of 
the administrative mind, the managerial mind, which uh, is so dire in all the worlds I know, in, in science, in medicine, and in the university, where instead of um, professionals being able to do what they know best, they have all the time to humour um, administrators who themselves are bogged down by the administration that they themselves created. They're not trying sinisterly to control other people. They themselves are the victims of the very system that they they set up. It is now bigger than anyone, and it's wasting resources, it's wasting time, it's causing frustration, it's negating creativity. And so the two things that everybody needs to do are cut back administration and management. And I don't mean by 20%, I mean by 80%, and cut back on controlling the people who are creative and instead give them the freedom and the peace in which to be creative. So that's what I want to say about that. But you, 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 you mentioned two things. One was um, an extraordinary uh, story that was told me by... Um, a member of the Green Movement in in Switzerland, uh, that as a young person he had had um, a house, or his family had a house, uh, next door to Jung's on um, a lake in Switzerland, and that uh, as a child he remembers going and visiting Jung, and Jung talking about what he had found out in America, where he'd been uh, listening to the stories told by North American natives. And one chief said, the white man is doomed. And, and Jung had said, why? And he said, because the white man sees like this. And he put his fingers on the tip of his nose and then stretched them out to a point in the distance and said, he sees a single goal and he takes direct steps to it. Um, and uh, then, uh, much later in life, uh, uh, 50 years later, he was talking to a self-made billionaire in Switzerland uh, about the phenomenal success he'd had as an entrepreneur. And he said, uh, I put it down to the fact that I have one single goal in mind. <laughs> I put it in the future and I go towards it. Uh, uh, in, in exactly the same way that um, the uh, the Native American had said um, was the doom of, of humanity. And so, I mean... It's true that maybe a short-term goal can be best achieved like this, but if we actually want to survive, then it's not the way to look at the world. And then there is this story, which I, I'm rather nervous about trying to abbreviate, because it's so subtle, it has so many aspects to it, and it's so beautiful. Um, but effectively, the idea is that because of a decline in the universe, two brothers were sent down from heaven to superintend the regeneration of the cosmos and bring back light to it. And these two brothers uh, were different in nature. One was called He Who Grasps the Sky with Both Hands, and the other was called Flint, and he was hard like Flint and was like an arrowhead, and had a single trajectory. And he was able to speak, but not really able to understand what the other brother was able to understand. So far, this is exactly like the relationship between the right and the left hemisphere. And anyway, um, the, 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 the sort of good brother started to create creatures. It created flowers, it created animals, it created birds, it created fish. And the other brother was jealous and thought, well, I will um, create my own. And he takes his brother's creatures and walls them up in a cave and starts making his own creatures. But instead of making um, birds, he, he, he makes um, moths and spiders. Instead of making um, flowering plants, he makes thorns and so on. And he, he creates even a creature that is like the human, but is a horrible misshapen creature, rather like a golem who, who, um, who runs away from him uh, in a distressed state. And um, so he thinks my 
I, my attempts to create have not been as successful as that of my brother. So I should go to my brother and seek some help. And he does. And effectively what the brother realizes is that is that he he needs to superintend the brother, but not to be too close to the brother, otherwise he will begin to get involved in the same way of thinking as the brother. And so he takes it upon him to create with his brother some new creatures. And uh, when they are to come alive, and when there is a human being that is to come alive, the good brother takes his own blood and puts some into the body of the human, and he takes some of his own breath and puts it into the lungs of the human, and he puts some of his speech into the human, and he puts some of his thinking into the heart and head of the human. And this human comes to life, and there is there is effectively the ancestor of human beings. But he's not quite the same as the one that he had first created. And so uh, he says, what shall we call this human being? Um, I will call him the hatchet maker, the bringer of strife, because I foresee that he will turn against me and try to destroy me. Whereas the first human being that I created was good and knew the, the path that things should take in order to um, flourish. And so you, you have a sort of story, I've, I've missed out many beautiful and subtle aspects of it. Um, but, uh, and, and there was a recording on the internet of me reading it, by the way, uh, I think on YouTube. But there again, we get this uncanny understanding of the dual nature of a human being. And the story ends with the good brother saying, uh, this human being that we have created together will run into into severe trouble, and I will come once to help him when he is in uh, in he is in grave peril, and I will come a second time, but the third time he will have to descend into fire, and that will be the end of him. And of course, in the Master and His Emissary, I show that once in Greece, a second time in Rome, and a third time in our own modern civilization since the Renaissance, we started with a human civilization that balanced the contributions of the two hemispheres, but have moved always towards the view of the left hemisphere, the view of Flint, the one with the arrow, who is very contented with himself, doesn't know what it is he doesn't know. And this is the third time we are in now. How amazing that those stories exist the master and his emissary but also the iroquois legend and it reminded me of another cherokee legend about an elderly brave who tells his grandson all about life and he put it as follows i thought i'd share this with you and please stop me if you know it so the the grandson asks what's the meaning of life and his son he says within all of us there's a battle between two wolves one is evil he is anger envy jealousy sorrow regret Greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. He continued, the other wolf is good. He has joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going on inside you and inside every other person too, he explained the wise Cherokee elder. The grandson thought about it for a minute, and then he asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? And the grandfather answered, the one you feed. And it made me think of those beautiful stories you shared, but also that unfortunately, what we're doing in the Western world, and perhaps further, unfortunately, is we're feeding the wrong wolf. And by that, I mean, in, in business, for example, those those people who get to the top and stay there are those people who are left oriented, if, if we call them that left hemisphere dominant. And then they they kill off the other wolf, they kill off that other hemisphere. And the biggest problem is, it, we're starting to see hopefully more and more people who are more holistic in their view, get into leadership positions. But there's a lot of tick the box exercises in that and diversity, etc. And I just thought I'd share that with you as a way to tee up this, both the importance of op 
uh, opposites because this is there's a chapter and I, I mentioned to you and and I will share links by the way for everybody listening to In- Ian's channel channel McGilchrist which is magnificent but also there's a m- brilliant speech that you give to Ralston College that I'll also share in which you give an overview of that chapter which is my favorite by the way because it brings everything together beautifully we need a snake in the garden we need we need as Alan Watts would say we need a background to know what the foreground is we need these opposites but the problem is it's tilted to the left absolutely I mean of course you know very much more about the business world than I do but I wondered if it was possible that at least some of the people who get to the top do so because they are imaginative and creative, um, but that they may still be rather um, in a stranglehold by an organisation that is cumbersome, uh, in, exists to follow rules and procedures and tick boxes. I mean, we must, must, must get away from that culture. We must liberate ourselves from this tyranny of the... It's, it's the conscious mind that knows so little that is trying to, to, to confine uh, the, the mind that knows so much. And, and th- that way, there is only one outcome. We will starve ourselves of life and of energy, and the civilization will collapse. So I do think that's very important. You, you also raised this, this matter of the opposites and how they came here. And you mentioned again Alan Watts, um, who I quote in the book as saying, um, people often seem as though what they want is to have um, mountains without valleys and valleys without mountains. But you cannot have a valley without mountains. And and that is um, a very important point. Um, it's one he, he went on making all his life. But it, it's, it's essential because we do believe that by going further and further in any one direction, we will create more of something that we desire. Whereas, in fact, we may get closer to the very thing that we feared most. The really essential point at the moment is that by wishing to free ourselves from fear, from danger, um, from anxiety. We are creating fear, danger and anxiety. And from trying to create a liberal society, which literally means one that is free, we are creating a tyranny. And I, I have seen in my lifetime the colossal change from a society that was largely free to one which is increasingly, week by week, less free, less liberal, in which we are subject to rules, procedures, and the point of view of a small clique that will not be contradicted. It can't even be debated. If you so much as even raise a question about some of the things that it believes, then you are an outcast. So this is a very sad state of affairs. Ian, I uh, again, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna do what I did in the intro, and I'm just gonna go w- where the right hemisphere brings me. I'm not gonna follow any logic here because the book is a whole. It, it, it is a whole. I know you break it into component parts, but it is mo- most magnificent when you experience it as a whole. And I, and what I did, what by the way, was I read, I read logically, but I listened from a different perspective. So I, I would listen to Channel My Gilchrist or some of your talks, even knowing that they were further on in the book. And, and that guy gave me this kind of hitting myself from every different view, including the different senses through which I experienced it. So I just wanted to share that that's how I did this. So I'm going to I'm going to just go with the flow yeah. as, as we should. As, <laughs> yes. And uh, I'm going to introduce this next part because I love this the importance of both music and the brain, but also uh, the holistic approach to life as well. So you say importantly, what we experience is not just an image of the world outside some sort of projection on the walls of our Cartesian theatre inside our heads and watched by an intracerebral homunculus on an intracerebral sofa. I love that. True, we can deceive ourselves by mistaking our own projections for reality, and we often do, but that does not entail that we are always victims of self-deception. When we are properly attentive, that we experience is the real deal, though it can be only a tiny part of all that is. To appreciate that, you need the right hemisphere, and preferably, of course, both hemispheres to be in play. 
It is true that we can see the world only partially, but we still see the world directly. It is not a representation, but a real presence. There is not a wall between us and the world. Our experience is of whatever it is, and not another thing. Even if we can't get away from the fact that it, it is we who experience it. So I just wanted to introduce that because it tees us up nicely for this beautiful analogy you share of Mozart's G minor quintet. What I'm trying to do is steer a course between two opposing views that are over simple and uh, well basically wrong <laughs> one is that we don't really have access to any kind of reality all we have is a dashboard on which there are images or readings of a world um, and we're effectively blind we're inside a sealed cabinet inside our skull and as to what the world out there is like we have no idea this is a fashionable point of view and what it leads to is the idea that we simply make up reality it's made up by us on the other hand there is an equally false view that reality is just something out there that is completely unchanged by our getting to know it and and what i want to suggest is that yes we play a part in the getting to know of whatever it is we do get to know. But that does not in any sense mean that we're just making it up. We really do make contact with reality. And so the partial nature of our knowledge is not that it only goes part of the way towards reality. It goes the whole way towards reality, but only one little part at a time. So it's a different kind of image. In one, you can see our mind, and then a screen, and then long way behind that, whatever is giving rise to it. And that's the, in a way, Kantian idea that we can't really know anything, we only know the contents of our own mind. And another view, which is that yes, we actually break through to a reality, but what we see is just a part of that reality, because another person looking at it would see not something wholly different, of course, they'd see something very similar, but they would see something slightly different, because they would be the person seeing it. So, on the one hand, it is not part of my case, that really we make things up. There's a, there's a, a position beloved of, of uh, educationists that is called constructivism, that really every child just makes up the world. And this is a very, very partial truth, that something of them goes into the encounter. That is true. But that there is no um, reality to generalize about, completely false. Um, because anybody who's really attending to it properly will be seeing something remarkably similar. And I use the image of, for the sake of argument, Mozart's G minor quintet, largely because I think it's one of the most staggering and profound pieces of music ever written. And I, I suggest that everyone that plays it, every time it is played, it comes into being slightly differently. So each performance is slightly different. Um, but there isn't one real performance in heaven, which is the, the right way that it should be played. There are just many, many ways of playing it, and some will be closer to something magnificent and beautiful than others. It's not complicated. You know, we can say, most people who know anything about music and know about Mozart listening to this performance by the Amadeus Quartet will say this is a very fine performance and they will largely be in agreement about it. So we don't have to despair just because part of us goes into the process of knowing reality. Um, that's really the idea behind that, that message, which is that both the piece of music itself comes into being out of connections and comes into being again every time it connects with the human mind. So in a way, it's sitting there in, a, in, in the book of scores, you know, a, a closed book on the piano top where you could find the score for the G minor, G minor quintet. Um, it sort of exists in a way, but really it's only a schema or a representation of it there. Whereas when it's played, it's not a representation. It's the real deal. You are really listening to G minor quintet. Um, but every one of them will be very slightly different in ways that matter to us. So that's really what I'm trying to do there, is navigate this, this difference between two very simple positions that I'm afraid many discussions about consciousness these days collapse into, uh, a, a, an objectivist view or a wholly subjectivist view. 
And it speaks to the world we're in where, you know, a VR representation or an upload to the cloud or a download from the cloud to, you know, of a template or a, a copy of a, an original piece. All these things are, are so much in there. NFTs as well, which is the whole new, the metaverse, etc. But, you know, I thought about that and I was, I was actually thinking about this for, from the child's perspective. So it has been proven that as we age, our age, our, our hearing degrades, etc. But also our perceptions change. And I thought about that, yes. that not just that, like, I, I don't think people actually think about this. And I, I just wanted to throw this out, out there, because it was as as is the way your work does to me, it certainly sparks lots of thinking, which is just, I, I, it's a magnificent gift to give that to somebody. So I, I want to thank you for that. But But one of those was that every time somebody listens to a music a piece of music I was like going they all hear it differently so my my taste is different from somebody's taste but it's also because it's based on all the past tastes that I've had to get to that point but also it's based on maybe I have tabula rasa from music I've heard as if I'm a child and the first time I hear music I'm going wow and I saw this magnificent video of a child who who was deaf who had hearing it that had a hearing aid and heard the parents voice for the first time and the smile on the face and I was like on that that must be what it's like for somebody to experience something like that for the very first time music for example but also then I thought about a movie or a piece of art that we all experience it differently but we think that the other person's experiencing the same of us I suppose it's like the problem of privilege or diversity as well that we don't know what's going on inside the of the other the mind of the other that's perfectly true. And I remember puzzling over this actually as a child and thinking another person looking at a post box sees it as red. I see it as red. But we can't tell whether the experience that that other person and I have is the same. We agree to call an experience that each of us has red. But whether if I were to pop into their skull, <laughs> I could actually see the same colour that I see. We just don't know. So that is true, and that can't be got round. But in a way, it's to be excessively sceptical to suggest that whatever is perceived is completely unlike that that's perceived by somebody else. Because our reactions to it are so similar. When we taste a certain... Um, food like anchovy, we taste its fishiness and its saltiness and so on. And, and it's not like somebody tastes it like that and another person finds it tastes like a grape, you know. So there, there are different experiences and we can, one can never quite get around that philosophical problem, I, I, I do agree. But nonetheless, there's enough common reaching out through the ways in which we describe our totality of experience for us to suspend disbelief and and accept that probably what we are seeing is quite similar to what another person would see and it made me One think thing, that, sorry go ahead Ian. no i was just gonna it just occurred to me um there's something in our brains that corrects towards certain things whatever happens for example as a child i had to have operations on my eye um, and I had one operation and I woke up from the operation and everything in the room was on a 45 degree tilt and I thought oh my god I hope I don't have to lead life on a slant and the the surgeon I told the surgeon who did a, a ward round afterwards and he said you'll see in a couple of days it'll all be completely level again and it was but what had changed was nothing to do with the eye the eye, the change in the eye, because the operation had presented my brain with new stuff, but the brain had learnt in a day or two to correct for that and give me back the world that I recognised before. So it, it tends to go towards things. And interestingly, it does this in evolution too. I mean, the, the fact that the eye has been created by an apparently entirely chance um, set of circumstances is extraordinary. This is so complicated and it needs so many things to come together at the same time. But interestingly, 
eyes have been created probably 12 or more times in the history of evolution, not just once, but in different creatures. And they have different structures, those eyes, but they nonetheless enable us to see. So there's something very primitive about eyes. And another little fun fact while we're on that, which I include in a chapter on the science of life, is that you can breed flies that are eyeless, because there is a gene that causes flies to develop eyes, but it also causes you to develop eyes. It causes a frog to develop eyes. You can take it out of the fly, and the fly will be blind. It will have no eyes. And if you breed those flies together, you get more flies that have no eyes. But get this, after 14 generations, you get flies that actually have eyes, even though they no longer have the gene. So the organism separately senses something dreadful has happened. I need eyes. And it has procured eyes in its growth as an organism from somewhere else in the genome, but not from that gene, because that gene has been cancelled. So that is, I mean, I have a whole chapter on purpose and I just want to say in case people get hold of the wrong end of the stick in that I do not argue that there is an engineering god who's made everything ahead of time but what I do argue along with many 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 scientists now is that the, the idea of sheerly blind mutation is is not supportable as a story of how we get um, the highly developed organisms that we we have Wonderful. You, you sparked so many thoughts for me. I was thinking, firstly, I, I don't know if you, so you know the way we're trying to train AI, artificial intelligence to do lots of things. One of the things they, they've attempted is to teach artificial intelligence to our robots, essentially to gather coffee beans, but it, it actually takes a very astute eye to be able to establish whether they're ripe or not. And it's very difficult for AI to, to detect the, the type of ripeness, but also as you know, birds, for example, see multitude versions of green, while we just call it green, maybe light green, dark green, but they see very, very different uh, ranges of green. I think I read that in the Master and His Emissary. But also then it made me think of Oliver Sacks in his book, The Anthropologist on Mars. He mentioned about this patient called Virgil, who had no sight and then all of a sudden had sight and couldn't take the input of data and asked for his site to be removed again. And I thought finally about the 45 degree angle. And as you as a French speaker, you'll appreciate this, that the, the term bias actually means slant, it means we're a slant as in on a on a, a patonk. Uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I think that's fascinating, because it, it really just shows you how there is diversity. And that diversity then, and where I'm going with all this is, if, if you think about the, the spectrum of seeing green or red or all those different things from across the species, but also in the species. And I thought then about, because you, you devote an a element of the book to autism and, and schizophrenia. And I thought about those neurodivergences, if you want to call them that, that, that neurodiversity, that that can be harnessed for the better. Yes, yes. Well, that's that's true. Um, I'd, I'd just like to mention one thing, which is that I probably didn't actually say that birds see more discriminations in the colour green than we do, uh, because we see an almost unbelievable uh, range of shades. The human eye is capable of discriminating millions and millions of slightly different hues. Um, but... Uh, and it's also not true that um, that the Eskimos see different colours of white and have different, you know, more names for snow than we have. They have about the seven uh, terms that we have, and they see snow as we do. So I, I just wanted to correct that in case somebody was saying, I don't believe that's true. I don't think. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, yes. Uh, what, what I think is, is uh, wonderful is, is your reference to neurodiversity in the sense of different brains that can achieve things that our brains can't, but can't achieve things that our brains can. So there are very few um, differences that bring with them no 
uh, compensatory uh, gift. And certainly in the case of autism, there are aspects which, uh, although they're not comfortable for the person, uh, enable them to have certain skills that probably um, without autism they might not have. One of the most baffling is the kind of autistic person who is able to carry out instantaneously massively complicated mental arithmetic. Um, you know, to enormous numbers of places, it, it, it is able to multiply and, and do things just like that, um, which would take us a very long time with a pencil and paper. And nobody really understands quite why that is. But presumably there is something that inhibits our knowledge uh, in the neurotypical brain that is not inhibiting it in the brain of somebody with autism. So Ian and I have agreed Perhaps this is a good time to call it. Ian has kindly, by the way, offered to do the show, continue with this, because even though he's got a sore throat and is suffering a little bit at the moment, so we're going to take a little break and we're going to come back and record again, hopefully. And I, I pulled a quote, so I was saying to Ian, even though we both know creativity is often about what you don't do, it's about the pauses as well as the filling <laughs> the gaps. It's we're, we're, we're trying to cram it way too much here. But I, I pulled the final quote in as a way to just kind of encapsulate part one. And something that I just love again, from your writing, you say, the world is a seamless, always self creating self individuating and simultaneously self uniting flow that is only truly knowable as it comes to be known. And creativity is always discovery of the self as well as of the other. Once one sees this, the objectivizing, time denying, change denying, diagrammatic mentality of modern Western thinking appears, as I believe it is a hindrance, not a help on the path to truth. I absolutely love that. The map is not the territory. Ian, it's been an absolutely beautiful, fascinating, informative part one. And I'm very, very grateful for your time, particularly with that uh, cold that you're nursing in the background and hopefully we do get to part two today if not no worries our audience will be very very eager to listen to you again and it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and you can see behind me there i have my mcgillchrist shrine uh the matter with things is there the master and his emissaries there and there is another book by the way and i i hope i had hoped to get to that and then the next thing you come out with this bad boy and uh blow everything up again but it, it kind of unites all your previous work as well so uh, it's been an absolute pleasure thank you enjoy your rest we're gonna have a mental amuse bouche and i'll see you shortly thank you very much thank you very much Aiden. look forward to talking again shortly <laughs>